Get your glasses up. Get your glasses up. A toast to the men. Welcome to a toast to the men with your guy, S.D. Booker. Welcome. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for the support. Hey, before we get started, hit that subscribe button. Hit that like button. Let's go. Changing the narrative. Now, for years, um, as far as back in my recollection, my, as far as back in, as my memory that I can go back to, I've always heard that the white man is the black man's or the black race biggest obstacle. That's what's holding us back. And I've also heard that black people have to work twice as hard to get to where a white, right, white person is, sorry. Now the first part of uh, the statement I just made, that white people is the biggest obstacle for black people, I totally disagree. That's a lie, that's a narrative that's been sold to us for different reasons, I believe, but I won't get into that right now. Now, the latter part of that statement, black people have to work twice as hard Maybe so. I, I, I lean towards yes. I lean towards yes. But, you know, who knows? And I say I lean towards yes, we have to work twice as hard to be seen and observed because we make up a smaller percentage of staff. We make up a smaller percentage of the population. We make up a smaller percentage of executives making those decisions, uh, people in management. So, Right, so if you just, if there's a pool of people, a pool of 100 people, right, and you stick your hand in that pool of people, pull people out, right, we got a 13% chance of being, our number being pulled, a 13% chance, right? So, you know, uh, it's not far-fetched to believe that we got to work twice as hard to be seen. Um just being transparent, being honest with myself. If I'm in a position to hire someone and I gotta choose one of two people, one's white, one's black, right? Or one could be Asian and one's black, or one could be Hispanic, one's black. If everything is equal between these two people, skill set, personality, experience, soft skills, uh, ambition, everything's equal right but i can only choose one person i'm choosing the black man yeah that's that's just what it is i'm choosing the black man if i gotta make a decision and everything's equal uh and if um everything's not equal but it's close and the white guy or the non-black person edges out the person of color the black person Edges them out. Not too far, but there is there is a gap, but not too big of a gap. I'm still going with the black person. If there's a considerable gap, I'm going with the non-black person. Because I want to win. I'm going with who I can win with, who really deserves it. But like I said, if there's a small gap, I'm going to go with the black person. I see nothing wrong with that. Uh, that's my comfort level. That's who look, looks like me. Um, I want them to win above all. So I understand if white people do it too. Now, like I said, if the gap is just too big, too obvious, come on, you got to go with the right candidate. But if it's close, I totally understand someone going with uh, someone that resembles them that they can relate to. I get it, right? So that part may be true, that we have to work twice as hard to be seen. Maybe, maybe not. But the white man is not our biggest obstacle. Uh, our biggest obstacle is us. And we got to stop believing the sob story, the sob narrative that the white man is holding us back. We are holding us back. And it all stems from the household. The household, man. And we got to stop blaming the white man because the household was broke up during slavery. Man, we gotta deal with our issues. Maybe that's the case. We gotta face our demons, face our fears, face the darkness, 
and deal with our stuff. You know, we can't keep crying over spilled milk. We got to deal with our stuff. And uh, the main problem is a lack of discipline and focus in the household. That's the main problem. And where do you get your discipline and focus and order? From a sound man. Not just any man, a sound man, but the father. A sound father gives you that discipline and focus. I don't care how tough a mother is, how tough she thinks she is, how strict she thinks she is, how good of a mother she thinks she is. You can't instill sound order and discipline and structure in the household. You, you just, it's impossible. Uh, you know, you, you can't do it. It takes a sound man to do that. And so... Men, uh, we got to take some accountability for the house being broken. Women got to take some accountability also. You know, we've been going at each other for decades now, and it's time to build, not just for ourselves, for the culture, for the family, for the community. And we just, we just got to stop blaming the white man for our struggles, for our downfall. We got to be disciplined and focused. Case in point. <clears throat> I got a few cases and points. When I was in the fourth grade, I was in tag, talented and gifted. So what happens, well, I can't speak on where you're from, what happened in my elementary school, um, and I'll try to remember this to, to the best of my recollection. I think either every day, Monday through Friday, or two or three times out of the week, half of the day, we will leave out our regular class, selected, talented and gifted children, we'll leave out the regular class and go over to another class, which was designated for the talented and gifted students. Right? Now, they also had another class called remedial reading. This was for people, for kids with reading disabilities or reading issues or problems, right? And so at a certain junction of the day, they will leave out the regular class also and go into that remedial reading classroom and get the help they needed. Now, I was in TAG in the fourth grade. I always scored higher than my grade level. Always, man. Me and my uh, youngest brother used to compete. Uh, I don't know if they do it now, but they used to have on the report court, in the report card, where the grade you're in and where you test out at, right? And so I always tested two or three grades higher than the grade I was in. So, and I was a gifted writer. Um, I used to paint, draw back then. I was pretty gifted back then. Told my wife recently I wanted to get back into that. But so, you know, I was talented and gifted. That's how they they labeled me, right? Fourth grade, right? Now, I come up in a single parent home, right? I'm getting to why I say that. Another person's in that class, one of my best friends, and I mentioned him in a couple of videos. I don't say his name and I won't say his name now. One of my best friends is in this class too. He's gifted, talented and gifted, so they say, right? He's in a single parent home, no father. Now these other three people that are in this class that I can remember, there was about 12 kids, but I can only remember certain ones, right? There's I'm gonna name three others, right? Uh, Anitra Phelps, and I'll say her name because I'm speaking totally positive, so I'll say her name. Anitra Phelps was in this class. She comes from a two-parent home. All right, stay with me. This white kid was in this class. His name was Lloyd. I cannot remember Lloyd's last name. Uh, I grew up with another guy named Lloyd who was black, but this Lloyd is white. He comes from a two-parent home. There's another kid in there. His name is Greg, Greg Nelson. Now, I believe Greg uh, comes from 
a single parent home, but he had a male, his father was involved, right? His father was definitely involved in his life. And so he had structure. So now, hey, went tag in the fourth grade. Me and my boy, we're doing our thing, but we're clowning. And man, this was a cool class to be in, man. We took us to museums, uh, took us to uh, the aquarium, took us to the botanical gardens, uh, went to an opera show. Um, man, different things to learn and experience and, and to uh, get culture and just have different experiences. It, it was wonderful. Even in class, that's, I'm talking about the field trips there, but even in class, Man, we were doing stuff you just don't do in your regular class for our science projects and, and uh, having different reading materials and critical thinking, uh, group exercises, uh, leadership exercises, different things to build you up uh, for leadership. So this was a great experience, all right? Turn this up, this, this is bothering me. So this was a great experience, great experience. But me and my boy, we're class clowns. No structure, man, single parent home, no father figure, even spending any time with us, right? Ironically, man, our mothers had decent jobs and uh, worked for the phone company. They both worked for the phone company. They weren't friends or they didn't converse, but just, I guess, you know, by chance. They both work for the same telephone company, man. Anyway, <clears throat> he stayed on the next street for me. We were boys, tight, tight. So we go the next year, fifth grade now. We're in tag again. We're still being clowns, class clown, but we're doing our thing, just being dis disruptive, laughing, giggling, picking, you know. Just no order, man, no discipline. Nietzsche's doing well, two-parent home. Lloyd's doing well, two-parent home. Greg's doing well. You know, uh, I believe his father and mother had recently divorced, but his father is heavily involved. He's doing well. Okay. Sixth grade rolls around. Now, if I can remember, I got a letter in the mail between transitioning from the fifth grade to the sixth grade that I was getting kicked out of tag. My boy got kicked out too. <laughs> no surprise. We both got kicked out. Everybody else remained in it up to the sixth grade, into the sixth grade. Now, sixth grade rolls around. Now, remember, I told you there's also a class for remedial reading students, people struggling with reading. But I also told you I score above my grade always, my reading, my mathematics, everything. Uh, my language arts, everything is above the grade I'm in, two, three grades above. I score high. I have no deficiencies in learning. So sixth grade rolls around. This day comes where they're pulling out the kids who need remedial or reading and calling their names. They got to go to this other class half of the day. And we know who's going to go because these guys – Girls and guys go, they got to go to this class every year, man. It's like they don't get better. You know, they never get out this class. Probably because they're not getting work with at home, whatever. But we already know. So it's no surprise. We know where they're going. We know who whose name is going to be called. But yeah, such and such. Yeah, yeah. It's always one girl. <laughs> it's never like two or three girls, right? It's always like that one girl. But several guys. But yeah, he's going. Yeah, yeah. You know, we might have a little snickering. You know, whatever. Like that, dude can't read, right? Clowning. My name is called. I'm like, what? My, they called my name again to come to this class. I got to join these guys in this class. I'm like, what the hell? Now, I take pride in scoring high, right? But I be clowning. I used to clown and tag, clowning. I guess they're going to teach me a lesson or something. So, man, I get up. I get in line. 
at the rest of these kids, man, I go to his class. And I'm like, man, I don't have problems reading. And I'm, I'm so we going through the class, man, we get to uh, these exercises and we start reading. Everybody has to read a passage and I'm seeing these kids struggling reading. I'm like, man, what am I doing in here? And it gets to me, man, I read fine. My reading is perfect. So I go home after after school. I go home. I tell my mom, man, they got me in this remedial reading class. I don't got any, any issues reading. Whatever, something happens. I'm out that class. So I don't have to go back. But I learned a valuable lesson in that. Even being so young and it's a sixth grade, man. You play stupid games, you get stupid prizes. I also learned that opportunities can be missed if you are not disciplined and focused. I had a great, remember what had great opportunity being in that class. Uh, intellectually, you know, we deserve to be in that class. Uh, as far as maturity, we did not. Uh, Discipline-wise, we did not. You know, we didn't take it serious or clowning. But uh, it taught me a valuable lesson that you can't get anywhere that you want to get to without discipline and focus. Now, ironically, the teacher of that class was a white lady. Right? She was a white lady. She wasn't holding me back. The principal of that school at the time, Mr. Money, fat white guy, paddled me, me a few times. This is back when you get paddles, man. Coach Turner used to paddle me. Mr. Money, Coach Turner was a black coach. Mr. Money used to paddle us. This is when you could, we, you could do that, right? Corporate punishment. He didn't hold me back. They gave me an opportunity. There were white kids in that class. I can only remember one white kid's name because I remember him being tall and we were cool. And he was a redhead, tall redhead kid. That's why he sticks in my mind. And plus, we, we were real cool. But he never let me and my boy distract him. He stayed on point. You know, they might look over a little bit, snicker, but man, they stayed on point. And my boy got kicked out playing stupid games, we got a stupid prize, right? I got the most stupidest prize, the stupidest prize by being embarrassed by, you know, going to that, having to go to that class for that one day. Man, that lesson still applies to my life as an adult. Anything I acquired, any level I got to, it was because I was disciplined and focused. Anytime I didn't acquire something, anytime uh, I failed at getting something, it was because I wasn't disciplined and focused. Point blank. Point blank, man. So we got to stop selling this narrative that we're being held back. We're holding ourselves back. It's not ironic. It's not coincidental that the two kids that did not have a strong father figure in the home or even a father that would come visit them and spend time with them were the two most undisciplined kids in that classroom. That's not a coincidence. That kind of stuff is going on today. Now, luckily, you know, he and I just had a, 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 a love for learning and we were quick learners, had a, a aptitude to, to pick up things quickly. And so we had no deficiencies reading or anything like that. But we were getting by just on, you know, pure intellect. We weren't disciplined. We weren't disciplined and we paid the price for it. It goes on today. We're holding ourselves back. We're also holding ourselves back because we don't really understand and appreciate the value of education. 
And when I say education, that doesn't mean you have to go to college. That doesn't mean you have to get a degree. But you got to be well studied. You got to be well studied. You got to be able to pick up a book with nobody telling you to and read. You got to be able to research and deep dive with no one around, no one pushing you. You have to have a thirst for knowledge. You have to be disciplined and have a thirst for knowledge to be able to focus and be alone and learn and soak in knowledge. If you can't do that, if you're not disciplined, you'll never get to where you want to be. And you'll always be making excuses. Always. Another case in point. I said I had several. Another one. Now, I told you guys, you know, what jump-started the book, A Toast to the Men. I was going through some custody battles with my kids. Got nasty, got real nasty. Well, at one hearing where um, she was trying to get an order of protection, you know, uh, uh, against me, I represented myself, right? She had an attorney. I represented myself. Long story short, I ended up, ended up winning. But something happened within that hearing uh, that was eye-opening for me. And I was like, man, I, I've made some messed up decisions. When my ex was stating her case why I shouldn't uh, be with the kids or whatever, and like I said, I won. It was thrown out. She told the judge that one of her reasons was that I'm too hard on the kids. The judge go, how, how is he hard on the kids? Well, he just won't let them be kids and let them be free. They tell me that when they're with him, they got to read every day for at least 30 minutes every day, even on the weekend. They got to read every day. He just won't let them be kids. Man, that judge, a white lady, that judge, that white lady, that white female judge just looked at her. The bailiff, I looked over, the bailiff looked at her. And they just shook their head like, what in the hell is this woman talking about? And that's when I really, really had realized, book, y'all should have never procreated. What were you thinking? You wasn't thinking. Bro, we don't understand, as a whole, we don't understand the value of education. We don't respect it. We don't respect it. And uh, we suffer from it. But we want to blame the white man. Man, I'm not a Bible thumper, man, but I, I respect the Bible. And if you look in that Bible, the Bible, the Bible, man, puts discipline on a very, very, very high platform. God respects a disciplined man. God will... Bless the universe, God, whatever, will bless a disciplined man. And that's what we got to get back to. This is my last point that made me realize we really don't get it. And this is with, this is with my, my own wife. And uh, this is a bit different than my ex, right? A lot different. But uh, when I came, when we came into each other's lives, uh, the twins, her twins, uh, or maybe 12. Now, boy and girl, fraternal twins. Now, after just, you know, a few months, man, I, I realized that the boy had some genius to him. Like his mind, the way his mind worked, very mechanical. Uh, and my wife, she, she would tell me that, uh, that she was just my girlfriend at the time, you know. But she would tell me that, uh, she was frustrated that he, for years, would take devices, electronic devices, 
it'd be whatever, man, a remote, uh, whatever, laptop, anything electronic, his toys, anything electronic, he would take it, break it down, not break it, break it down, disassemble it, right, to see what's inside of it, how does this thing work, break it down to pieces, and then put it back together. I was like, man, that, she would get frustrated. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, you got some on your hands here. That's called reverse engineering. You, you don't even know what's in your house. You, you don't even know what you got in your house. This is a genius. This is what the Japanese do. Reverse engineering. And nobody taught him this. His mind just, this is the way he was created. You got something special. And so, man, listen, man. We got to get disciplined focus. We got to make learning important. We got to make curiosity important, discovery important, research important. Let these kids' minds research things. Let them experience things. Let them be curious. Right? Let them grow. Let their minds grow. But also have a regimen. If they don't have it on their own, so, so some kids just naturally like to read. But if they don't have it on their own, there needs to be a regimen for reading. We got to get back to that. We got to change this narrative that you either have to have uh, you have to have either have to sling crack rock or have a wicked jump shot. That's not true. That's a lie. That's a lie we've been telling ourselves, and we keep on telling that telling that lie to our kids and to our grandkids. That's a lie. That's a victim mentality. And man, we can do better. I know we can. So come on, man. Let's tighten up. Let's man up. Let's get disciplined. Let's get focused. And do what we got to do, man. We got all the tools we need to succeed. No victims here, man. Only victors. All right? From me to you, love, peace.